In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good and Master of life, Come, dwell within us, Cleanse us from all stain, And save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Today, we're going to be looking at the 33rd Sunday of the year in Cycle B. Uh, and uh, that's the 33rd, that means there's one more, and we finished the liturgical cycle for, for B. The last one next week, the 34th Sunday, is always the, the Feast of Christ the King. The, that reality that divine human reality toward which all history is always converging, and we celebrate him as king. This week, we're going to be looking at the, um, you might call it the issue of judgment. Um, it's finality, as you'll see. Um, now, as you remember, I've been working in the first section on tracing what you might call the um, the uh, drive toward uh, domination by a dictator. And that is one of the fruits of what um, I'm going to be discussing right now. That is atheist humanism. It's, you could call it atheist humanism in a way it's more anti-theist, or perhaps even anti-Christian uh, humanism. I'm going to be relying a lot on this book by uh, Father, actually Cardinal Henri de Lubac. I read this book when, when I was about 20 years old in a first edition, and it had a powerful effect on me, it still does, and I want to share some of the conclusions of that book uh, now. The last person he treats of in the book, after treating of Auguste Comte, Friedrich Nietzsche, Karl Marx, Feuerbach, he treats of Dostoevsky, who is the mystical prophet reading what's really going on, because it's not atheism in the usual sense of the term, it's anti-theism and really anti-Christ. Uh, and it's been going on a long time deifying man. And so it's that that we're going to be looking at because it's so important to understand the undertow, the drive in what we encounter in so many parts of the world today. Um, I'm going to take this part, it's in, almost in the conclusion of the Lubach's book, where he's looking at Dostoevsky and um, the brothers Karamazov. And I'm going to start now uh, toward the end um, where there's a long passage in which Alyosha comes to visit his older brother Ivan. Ivan is in jail. <clears throat> Ivan tells Alyosha that he plans to write a poem about the Grand Inquisitor and he describes it to him. The setting is Seville in the 16th century. And Jesus comes and he's talking to people, maybe healing a few very quietly. And then there's a scene where the uh, Grand Inquisitor is a tall, ascetic, 80-year-old Franciscan, hard as nails. And uh, he's standing across the street from the, cath from the cathedral. A girl is being born out dead to her burial. And the crowd, those who recognize Jesus, beg him to raise her up, and he does. He raises this girl there in Seville. The Grand Inquisitor is across the street and watches that. And he says to his assistant, get that man arrested. So they put Jesus in jail. And uh, at midnight, the Grand Inquisitor comes down and starts to talk to him. Uh, and uh, 
he comes in, and I'm going to just read part of this dialogue. Why are you here? The Grand Inquisitor asks Jesus. He knows who he is. Why have you come back? You came and offered men freedom, and that was your mistake. They didn't want to be free. Man does not want to be free. He wants to be safe. And freedom is too great a risk. You came to show love and to evoke love. But man is not equal to that. That's the cynical, always the anti-theist bias of uh, this kind of social action and social organization. Okay? Um, he goes on to say, the Inquisitor, it's taken us nearly 1,500 years to undo your mistake. Now I'm quoting from the book. The terrible and wise spirit, the spirit of self-destruction and non-existence, the great spirit talked with you, and we are told in the books that he apparently tempted you. Now he goes on. You could have changed those stones into bread. You want social action? Think what you could have done. The whole world would have followed you. You could have had anything you wanted, providing man for his bread on earth. Um, they would have hung on your every word. See, we know what they need. We have deceived, deceived them, and they willingly let themselves be deceived for the sake of the bread we give them. They will marvel at us, and they will regard us as gods, because having become their master, we consented, and this is the key, we consented to endure freedom. We're free, and we know what we're doing, and it's a great burden, but we're willing to carry it for the sake of humankind, so they don't have to be free. We can tell them what to do, and they will willingly do it, even though they hate us for having this authority. They trade their own freedom for security. We tell them what to do, and they do it. Okay. Um, so then... Uh, he says, now, you, the way that mankind is bewitched is through miracle. Uh, the second is mystery. And the third is authority. So the first temptation. You could have thrown yourself off that parapet as, as the devil, the great master he's calling him, uh, invited you. And the angels would have caught you, and the whole world would have followed you. Uh, but you understood perfectly that in taking one step, in moving to cast yourself down, you would at once have tempted God and lost all your faith in him. And you would have been dashed to pieces on against the earth you came to save. And so then they go, we go on, you see? Uh, the second one, uh, they they would have so willingly followed you. You see, the second temptation, multiply stones, make them bread. You want to get rid of world hunger? You could be the hero. Now, I want you to look closely at what Dostoevsky, the artist and the mystic and the very deep Christian, is seeing. Resentment against God. This is not atheism. This is anti-theism. And we will take God's place. And we are angry at God. You see? And so we will, uh, you see, give all the social security, all the health care, all the whatever people want. And they'll follow us everywhere. We know what we're doing. And we pay the price for that. They don't know. And they're happy. They hate us. and uh, But they'll obey us because we, we take away from them the burden of freedom. We just do, they just do what we tell them. Okay? Now the second miracle, uh, throwing yourself off that parapet, everyone would have recognized who you were. And the third 
just kneel down and adore me and the whole world is yours. You could do what you want. You want to save them. You want to make them happy. You could do what you want. You just adore me and the world is yours. You don't have to work for it. And Jesus says, you know, that last one, get behind me, Satan. Because you don't speak the things of God. Those are the three great temptations of the human race. You see, it's not atheism, even though Delubac puts his book as a- it's, it's, it's atheist humanism. It's an anti-God movement. The big problem is God and worshiping God and sinning and getting forgiven and all of that. We have to eliminate that from human consciousness. And we will run. Do you see the pride in this? This is what drives people toward what they're actually trying to do is to make a utopia. And because of that, they are above any moral consideration. You know, as Saul Alinsky says, we're talking about a communist revolution, everything is legitimated by the revolution. Mao Zedong killed a hundred million people because they were in his way. Stalin killed 20 million. Hitler killed 10 million, pursuing this, but in a very specialized way. The other two, Stalin and Mao Zedong, they are exactly this. You see, we will, we know what we're doing. If we can promise the world, you see, that we can feed them, that we can take care of them. The irony is, of course, that um, in communist China, the wealth, the, the leaders were very wealthy, but the people were, were waiting on line for their food every day. It didn't work. That's why I finally got overthrown. But the illusion, you don't have to just do what we tell you and uh, everything will be just fine. You won't have to worry about anything. And so, uh, you see, uh, these were the temptations in the wilderness. They were all temptations to get Jesus to turn from his vocation as son of man and son of God and savior of the world by dying on the cross out of love for us and in reparation for our sin. The, the, the Grand Inquisitor and all his friends, all the demons, they know that that's the way to save the world. And that's why they're trying to get him to do something else and be a hero. And that is the temptation of utopia. You, my utopia justifies anything I want to do because I am a hero. Do you grasp the depth of that pride and anger? Look at the human situation. Children dying of cancer, people dying of starvation. I am going to fix it. I am mad at God that it is this way and I'm going to fix it. And that's what's going on. And whether I lie or cheat or steal, the one thing you always notice in these leaders is they never run out of money. Uh, and they're going to build the world on OPM, other people's money. And they are going to be giving out the food and the jobs and the security and the good positions in government and so forth. They will do all that. This is the temptation of utopia. And utopia, this vision of utopia, you see, justifies anything, including the murder of a hundred million people.